From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Nikki Haley vows to stay in the 2024 Republican primary race as she sharpens her political attacks on Donald Trump. Meantime, a New York judge hits Trump with a $355 million judgment in the civil fraud case against his real estate empire. Welcome. I'm Kyle Peterson with The Wall Street Journal. We are joined today by my colleagues, columnists Bill McGurn and Kim Strassel. Let's start today in Greenville, South Carolina. The state's primary is coming up on Saturday, and Nikki Haley had called the press together for some remarks at noon, fueling speculation that she might be prepared to drop out and avoid what looks like a pretty solid defeat here coming on Saturday. But quite the opposite, she said, I refuse to quit. South Carolina will vote on Saturday. But on Sunday, I'll still be running for president. I'm not going anywhere. Let's listen to a bit more of what Haley said. Trump and Biden are two old men who are only getting older. Nearly 60 percent of Americans say Trump and Biden are both too old to be president because they are. We've all seen them fumble their words and get confused about world leaders. That's not who you want in the Oval Office when Russia launches a nuclear weapon at our satellites or China shuts down our electricity grid. Bill, it does seem to me that Haley is sharpening her argument against Donald Trump. Just to do a quick check of the polls there in South Carolina, the Real Clear Politics average for the primary is 62% Trump, Haley 37%, with a little bit of variation if you check individual polls. But South Carolina, again, one of those states like New Hampshire, where it's an open primary, you don't have to be a registered Republican to come out and cast a ballot. Yeah, I think that that dynamic is the key to Haley versus Trump. She is much more likely to get independent votes And she's strong that way. You need independent votes to win the presidency. But she's weaker with Republican voters. Trump is the opposite. I don't think his appeal to independents is quite as strong. His appeal to Republicans is much stronger. In terms of her argument, it looks, at least for now, that she's not going to defeat Donald Trump in the primaries. That's not how she gets the nomination. She gets the nomination if he's somehow derailed from his legal troubles or something else, health troubles, and they're looking for another candidate. And she's hung in there and says, I am the best person to beat Joe Biden. And actually today, though the focus is on Trump and what she said about Trump, she was actually pretty targeted about Biden saying she is the best conservative Republican hope to beat Joe Biden. And remember, Bernie Sanders is only a force today because he stayed in against Hillary Clinton. Otherwise, no one would know him. He'd be an obscure New England socialist. Another notable new line of attack for Haley over the long President's Day weekend was on the death of Russian dissident Alexei Navalny. Let's listen to Haley on ABC this week on Sunday. He not only after making those comments that he would encourage Putin to invade NATO, but the fact that he won't acknowledge anything with Navalny, either he sides with Putin and thinks it's cool that that Putin killed one of his political opponents or he just doesn't think it's that big of a deal. Either one of those is concerning. Either one of those is a problem. We've got to start seriously having a conversation in America about our national security. On Monday, President Trump broke that silence in a truth social post. Here is a part of what he said. The sudden death of Alexei Navalny has made me more and more aware of what is happening in our country It is a slow, steady progression with crooked, radical left politicians, prosecutors and judges leading us down a path to destruction. So, Kim, a mention of Alexei Navalny there. But what about me is the the response from Donald Trump. And I've long since stopped wondering whether a bizarre statement like that from Donald Trump will cost him in this primary. On the other hand, it's hard not to reflect what a bizarre statement from the former president. It strikes me as a kind of statement that you make if you are actually avoiding the question of Vladimir Putin. And that's what I found so disappointing about it, is that his need to try to somehow connect this to what's happening in the United States and to him 
rather than a very clear denunciation of the brutal dictator and autocrat who has invaded Ukraine and who has squashed out pretty much any attempts or efforts of any opposition in the party. Because, of course, that is the history and story of Alexei Navalny, who has been a lawyer and opposition leader and anti-corruption activist and who was then subjected to any number of sham trials in order to lock him up. And ultimately, it would appear, uh, have him murdered or at least deny him the care he needed after he was poisoned with a nerve agent, by the way, by Putin's people. Either way, it amounts to his death at Putin's hands. And that should have been easy for Trump to say. But this, of course, goes back to his long time, sort of almost at times admiration he has expressed of Vladimir Putin, his reluctance to actually call him out. And again, I agree with you. I don't necessarily think this is going to hurt him in the primary, but it ought to be giving a lot of people pause about his approach to foreign policy. Bill, what do you make of this and the broader story of Navalny? As Kim referenced, he was poisoned by a Soviet nerve agent a few years ago, then had been in jail since 2021. The story that is coming out of Russia is that he collapsed after a walk at his prison colony. But Bill, I mean, am I wrong to think that one way or another, I mean, he was killed by Putin and the Putin regime? Yeah, he illustrates what the regime is. The sad thing is that it's not a one-off event. People in Russia that oppose or Putin thinks oppose him They have a habit of falling out of windows in their hotels. He shoots down civilian airliners or backs the people that shoot them down. He jails one of our reporters and so forth. So as Kim says, it was an opportunity for Trump because the contrast, Navalny, embodies so much what is wrong with Russia and what is wrong with Putin. And he flubbed it. You don't know what reasons are coursing through former president's mind, but it sounds personal. I don't know why he continues to do that, but he does. And it gives openings to his critics. The news this morning is that Navalny's mother is asking for the release of his body, which has not happened yet. You can understand why they would potentially not want to release His body. The other point of contrast here is that there's all sorts of stories and photographs now of mourners, people near a wall of grief, for example, being arrested by Russian police. And Kim, that's another thing to keep in mind. There are sometimes comparisons between what is happening in the United States and what is happening in Russia. And I think looking at these photographs of people at a wall of grief being arrested for putting out flowers, for example, for an opposition figure is something that should bring people back to the realities of what life is really like in Russia. Yeah. And first of all, we should praise those people for doing that because it takes enormous courage Because the second point here is those sites show just how dramatically worse things have become in Russia under Putin. He's obviously been there for decades now. But I would note that going back to 2013, Navalny was actually able to run in a mayor's race in Moscow. He came in second with 27 percent of the vote. It was a race with a lot of competitors in it. That at least was the fiction of a competitive election. And in the wake of that and other elections that were very sham and information that Navalny's anti-corruption groups had come out, there were moments when there were tens of thousands of Russians who came out at a time protesting Putin and that regime. You do not see that anymore these days. The last time there was something like it was when Putin invaded Ukraine. Already at that point, people had become scared. So there were fewer people. And those that did come out were immediately rounded up and taken away. The message being that absolutely no opposition will be brooked these days. And that if you do so, terrible things will happen to you. Navalny himself, Going back to when he did some of these demonstrations, he was initially tried and convicted on sham embezzlement charges, but he was given a suspended sentence because Putin was concerned enough back then to arrest him and imprison him would provoke more upheaval and more demonstrations. It is a sign of how he feels just absolutely in control that he feels these days that he's not even worried anymore about those opposition protests. And he's happy to send Navalny away and have him murdered in prison. And he doesn't fear any consequences. (laughs) 